OK, so today we are going to start uh, <coughs> working with asynchronous programming. So I hope uh, you slept well and had a lot of coffee this morning because uh, it's something that will require us to, to think uh, uh, in a different way according to how the JavaScript language uh, manages this asynchronous stuff. OK? So uh, you remember last week uh, we we focused on uh, programming through callbacks. Okay, we saw that, uh, for example, all the functional programming methods uh, were working by providing a callback function that will do some part of the work, some comparison or some transformation or whatever. And uh, uh, those, uh, just to remind uh, ourselves, uh, the functional programming function um, the methods, they all required one callback function with uh, a specific, uh, let's say, signature, so uh, a function that uh, would require, so would receive some argument and would return some kind of value, depending, of course, on the, on the functionality. But all these callbacks uh, were synchronous callbacks. With that, I mean that uh, uh, the execution of the calls to our callback function were all within the time frame of the execution of this method. So for example, filter will call, I have a list of 100 elements, uh, will call 100 times my function. But uh, all the 100 calls uh, will happen before the code goes on to the next instruction. OK, so it's normal function call. I have a function that calls other functions. And until those functions return, I do not continue working on the on the uh, external function or on the external program. Okay, that's the easy way. No, that's a synchronous programming. What we are adding now is an asynchronous behavior, in which the execution of the callback function is not bound anymore by the execution window of the caller function or the function that defines that uh, define the callback itself. So, um, Let's start from some, some simple example, for example. OK. Um, um, just uh, one warning. Um, JavaScript has, uh, supports very well an asynchronous programming model, even if uh, JavaScript itself is a synchronous language. Uh, this means uh, that uh, there is no real concurrency in JavaScript code ever. OK, so if you have something that is asynchronous, it doesn't mean that it runs in parallel with your code. It just means that it runs at a different time. But when an asynchronous code function is executed, then the main code will not be executed. It's being stopped, and vice versa. OK, so we don't have all the concurrent execution problems that you have in programming system course uh, where you have shared memories and uh, somebody is trying to modify your variable while you are reading it or something like that. Okay, this doesn't happen in JavaScript. You know that when a function begins executing, it will always end uh, in its own time frame. But the uh, function may schedule other stuff to happen later, schedule other callbacks uh, to be called later. And by later, I mean after my function has completed. We remember the concept of closure by which uh, a function remembers a variable, OK, even when the function defining that variable doesn't exist any, anymore. And th this concept, of course, will be important because uh, the function will be executed uh, really when the, the, the function is no longer uh, active. OK, so this is just. Uh, Asynchronous means it doesn't uh, uh, um, happen sequentially, but it will not happen really concurrently. So there will be some time where the main execution stops uh, and the callback function will execute, uh, and vice versa, when the callback function stops executing, then we can resume the, the, the main program. Um, we will see in detail how these mechanisms work with basically a, a, a list of tasks to be executed. Uh, when we um, study the events mechanism inside the browser, OK? But for the moment, just uh, asynchronous doesn't mean concurrent. Hmm? Doesn't mean parallel. It just means this function will execute 
but not right now, later on when it's the case, when some, typically when some input-output operation happens or when some user action will trigger it. Um, so the easiest uh, asynchronous function is uh, a timeout. What is a timeout? A timeout uh, is a built-in method in the standard library, built-in function basically, set, called set timeout. Uh, set timeout uh, um, requires basically at least two parameters, a function and a time. Okay, so what set timeout does is to schedule this function to be called after this number of milliseconds, for example. So if I, let's just make an example. Huh? I have a function hi, hmm? where I'm using the, the simple syntax so that uh, uh, we, don't, we don't get confused with arrow function for the moment, okay? And so we just, uh, that prints high, hmm? a very sophisticated function. And then I can, of course, call the high function and it will print uh, the value and this is easy, okay? See, this is called a sing. If I call uh, in week three, zero three. If we call uh, async of them njs, uh, it will print high, and that's easy, okay? What, what happens if I want to delay the execution of this function? What I can do is to set, call the set timeout function, that requires, uh, you see, uh, one, two arguments, and many, many more if we want. So the first argument is a handler function, a function that will be executed. I want to execute a function called hi when after a given number of milliseconds. So let's say a thousand. Okay. And uh, let's print something else. after, and something before. Okay? So I'm printing before, I'm scheduling something to happen, I'm printing after. And what happens here, I run it again, before and after and are executed right now, immediately, and the high will be printed after one second. Okay, let's do it again. So, what does it mean? It means that uh, the main program co here consists of four instructions, basically. One instruction is just the function definition. Okay, we'll define a function and set it aside. Then, we have a statement console log, which is executed. We go to the next statement, set timeout, which is executed, and then statement on line seven, which is also executed. So I'm executing the statement one by one sequentially. Statement of line six is the, uh, says that, uh, okay, I'm scheduling this function high to be called at a later time. So the Set timeout call itself happens right now immediately, but it doesn't call the function right now. It will just remember to call it later. It will put it into a, a queue, basically, uh, of, uh, of functions to be called. Okay, so everything that happens inside this function, I, will really, uh, happen after all the main code of the function is executed. And so uh, this instruction runs, the program ends after printing after, 
but uh, uh, the Node.js uh, will still see that there is some scheduled task that is still running. So the program doesn't terminate immediately. The, the execution of the main code finished. But uh, you see, it doesn't return to the prompt until it also prints high, because it knows that there's something scheduled to happen later, and so we wait until there are no longer any functions to be executed. I still have to call that function. I cannot kill the program yet. It's not finished yet. Okay, so until there is something to run, of course, the program is still alive. And uh, I can do that uh, or in this way. I can also use a narrow function to print uh, something else at a different time. For example, okay. So I want to print something before, after 500 milliseconds. Uh, I want to print uh, another word. We cannot do this uh, this will be wrong because what would happen here is that uh, we are this is a synchronous function call here. I'm calling this function here, and I'm using the results of this function as a, the argument of the set timeout function. So it's not something that you want. If I try to run it, uh, it doesn't work because uh, it will print uh, before. It will print I'm here because while trying to evaluate this argument. And then uh, the, the set timeout function will complain because the argument must be of type function. And right now, the argument of this, of this uh, set timeout is the result of console.log, which is probably undefined. Okay, it's not a function. If we want this, fun this code to be executed, we must wrap it into a function, maybe another function, an arrow function, like this. So I'm giving you a function that takes no parameter and its body prints a message. And this function is being passed to the set timeout that will schedule it for half a second later. OK, so let's try to run it again now. And now it's working. So remember, when you are uh, setting a, um, an asynchronous callback, always put the code into a function, because it's the function that will be stored and will be called later on. Try to avoid calling the function or executing the code right away. You want to delay it, or you want to, uh, to set it aside. So the first argument of a timeout must always be a function, must be an explicitly defined function or a narrow function is the same. No? It's always a function. And uh, what happens if this function takes some argument? Hmm? Maybe it takes an argument x, uh, and I will say that I'm here, Mr. X. using an interpolation. So I'm defining a function that takes one parameter, and it uses this, that value inside its value. Okay? So right now, if I'm running this, I'm expecting to see an undefined value, Mr. Undefined, which is a nice name for a superhero or whatever. But we want to... So... Uh, provide an actual value. Uh, this is what the additional uh, arguments of set timeout uh, are for, these arguments, optional list of arguments uh, that may happen. So I can provide here some arguments, uh, like, uh, uh, let's say, boss. And if I run this, 
you will print Mr. Boss. So what follows here are values that are evaluated now and will be passed to the function later. So when I schedule the function, I, already, I must already know which values are to be passed to the function, but I don't want to execute it yet. So I'm expecting a function that, re that requires one argument, and I'm providing the argument here, for example. <coughs> of course, this makes sense if this is a variable, it's an expression, okay? because, because otherwise I, I could have just printed both here, but, uh, because it's, we are on the same line. Uh, but when this is a variable coming from another part of the program, uh, we can schedule the execution of a function that takes no parameters, no arguments, that's easy, and also schedule the execution of a function that takes one or more arguments as long as we provide them when we are scheduling the call. But what, we, what you see is that we are always executing these four instructions in a row, one, two, three, four, and then we wait for the other functions that are being scheduled, they are kept in a list of functions to be executed, and they will be triggered at the right time. So you see that uh, the second one is printed before the first one, even if it's scheduled later, because they have a different de delay. Yep? So the question is, what happens if I have the same delay? Uh, they should be enqueued in, list in, the, in the order of, uh, of definition. Because imagine a priority queue in which you are uh, storing the, the, the new events to happen. And uh, of course, if the time is the same, they will be appended in order of definition. But let's try not to ask ourselves this question, OK? A program should never or really never depend on the actual execution timing of the different parts or the different asynchronous parts of the program itself. So we should design a program so that the different, uh, if they are asynchronous, uh, I should not uh, make assumptions or too many assumptions about uh, when this is run. Hmm? Um, Let's make another example. Let's make it uh, a bit more complex. X equal to 3. OK? And uh, let's say that, oh, so, sorry, let's uh, change the name, uh, y. y equal to 3. And here, after, so let me have a bit more space so I open this body, I also increment y. OK? So uh, what happens if I print y here? Will it print? Uh, Three or four? Well, I think we all agree that it will print three. Uh, save and run. Yep. And, uh, okay. Why, if I set timeout. Uh, Console.log. Why? After 2000, it will probably print 4. Okay? But this, uh, uh, because I know, because you know, I only have three lines of code, uh, that uh, this third uh, uh, asynchronous function will be called after much later after the second one has been triggered. But if instead of uh, these numbers, or instead of scheduling them all together, I'm scheduling them 
in a synchronous function themselves and so on, I will never know which one runs first or later. So it's better if we avoid to make these assumptions, okay, in the design phase. And this is what uh, the ideas of functional programming helps. Every function, every callback should provi provide a new value for its return value, and should, we should never rely, never, no, it's a big, uh, strong word. We should be careful in relying on mutations, on changing variables or changing properties. Because when we are in a synchronous world, uh, we never know whether something already happened or not. Okay, or will happen later. Okay, with timeout, it's, uh, we are a bit explicit, but uh, uh, when we see the other events, uh, you are never sure. So never take for granted uh, when, you, when you write something like uh, an asynchronous call, like with some, the only function that we know right now is a timeout. Um, just imagine you're called without this function. We, you know that uh, the code in lines 14, 15, and so on will not rely, cannot rely on the execution of these callbacks. They will happen later. Even if we set it to zero, we can set it to zero. It, it will be executed immediately after this code is run. Remember the model, the code is always run sequentially. After a sequential block is finished, then JavaScript will look for any possible asynchronous, the next function to be executed. Okay, so it will never interrupt some uh, sequential code to run something asynchronous. So you see that the high is printed immediately, but immediately after the end of uh, line 14 and 15. With no further delay, but it will be scheduled uh, after this block is finished. Hmm? Okay, so the, the concept is not, um, not so difficult with, uh, with a timeout. Okay, we have a function, we have a reason for scheduling this function. In this case, the reason is some elapsed time. That function can work on some parameters of its own, can work on some closure of variables that are defined in an external context. Of course, variable y that would normally be destroyed after line 15 because the program is finished is kept alive uh, because there are at least two timeout functions, this one and this one that are keeping a reference on that variable. And so until these functions are also executed and destroyed, the, the variable y will remain alive, and so it can be shared uh, between the functions. But again, sharing a mutable va uh, value is, uh, requires some care. Okay, so this is the basic idea. Um, Asynchronous is a nice word, but remember that it's always sequential. So one line of JavaScript code is always running. Only one. At most one, I would say. Um, this means that in, we, we should try in callback functions to be as quick as possible. Okay, so imagine that you are programming a web page, and so when the user clicks on something or moves the mouse, you do something in the background you react to some user actions, which is the normal way of programming on the web. Um, so you move the mouse and this will trigger a callback to be called, running not on a timeout but on, a, on an event. And on my own mouse move, it's an event that can be generated. Okay, you do some computation there, but uh, that computation will uh, for the duration of this computation, you, the, your web page will be frozen. Nothing else can happen on the web page until that callback is returned. Okay, so if your JavaScript code is slow or it does a lot of work, then you are, uh, you are, we are risking to freeze the page from the user point of view. If we have some, lo some long work to do, 
we should, we must schedule it to be run asynchronously. So we run the minimum amount of code to, to schedule another function and say, okay, when you have time, run this function. So we try to break the execution into smaller functions that will run asynchronously with respect to each other and not have a long block of code that lasts a lot of computation. Hmm? Um, so that's a, a general no, suggestion Then we see when we go into the browser programming, how it maps to, to actual code. Um, and this is a normal uh, programming paradigm in JavaScript. So oh, um, this is another library that we are not going to use, but just to see how it works, uh, read line for uh, reading some input from the command line, okay, from the terminal. Normally, not uh, JavaScript doesn't run in the terminal, but just to see uh, the input. So we have console a lot for doing output. How can we do input? There is no input statement uh, in JavaScript. There is no synchronous input statement in JavaScript. You cannot write uh, console.read or whatever. Okay? Why? Because a, a reading operation from the terminal would be a blocking operation. Okay, I am blocking this code until you write or you type something. Okay, that's normal, but in JavaScript, if I'm blocking some code, I cannot be running all the other asynchronous stuff. So even if I get some you know, timeouts that are waiting to be run, if the code is blocked on an input operation, those timeouts will not run because I'm still in some block of sequential code, and until I get to the end of that block of sequential code, I cannot run uh, any other function. So the atomicity, the granularity of a synchronous code is uh, a function. A function is started and will always be completed. Until a function is completed, I cannot imagine running another function. So there are practically no blocking operation in the whole JavaScript library. If you want to play, you can try to do a, a here, a loop with many iterations, with many computations, just to waste time. And you see, if you see that if you're running, running a, you know, a one million multiplications or whatever, that will take more than one second for, to execute you will see that uh, uh, this timeout is not, will not be called after one second. It will only call after all the synchronous calls. So this is the minimum uh, amount of time that we are waiting. But uh, first of all, we, the JavaScript interpreter must be free to call the function. Okay? So try to avoid always uh, thinking about heavy code. And so, or blocking code. And uh, for example, uh, the, the module the read line, uh, when I want to read something, look how it works. Uh, where is a, we have a question method that will specify the question to ask, that will be printed right away, and then a function that will be called when the answer is available, when the user is typing something, will type something. Okay, so. Um, in this case, uh, I'm printing how old are you, and the console will wait for my answer. Then the program will continue in these instructions here. The strange thing is that any instruction that we have here will not know the answer. I schedule the question, but I don't know the, the instruction in line maybe 10, this will be time 11. I cannot know the answer because this code 11 will be executed before the callback. I'm just scheduling something. So the strange thing is that in many cases when we are using an asynchronous function for getting some information, there's nothing good that you can do after that in the following lines. 
because until we foul uh, ourselves uh, and uh, we, we know that no value can be extracted immediately. And where does this value go? Here. This callback will be called with the actual string provided by the user. And here, we know the answer in this call. This code can, will execute, and uh, of course, we, we can store it uh, somewhere else. Uh, and I don't know what, what we need to do. But all the processing of this value should happen inside the callback and never after scheduling it. Okay, so uh, we have one, let's say, set, set of statements that are scheduling stuff uh, and another set of statements that are using the results uh, of the stuff that has been scheduled. And usually the result is inside. And if we want to do something with this answer, that should be here in this code or in a function that has been called synchronously or asynchronously inside that code. OK? So uh, we are not um, going to use the uh, console interface. OK? As an example, we will use a, a database inter interaction, which is much more interesting for experimenting with this kind of asynchronous stuff. Okay. Um, here we have the two basic functions for uh, managing time, set time out we already know, and there is another, uh, let's say, similar function which is called set interval. The difference between a timeout uh, and an interval is that the timeout happens once and uh, an interval happens uh, periodically, so every second. It automatically reschedules itself uh, every thousand milliseconds, every 500 milliseconds or whatever. So if we want to set something that will happen for forever at a given pace, uh, you can set at an interval. Uh, for example, this is, a lot, is used in, the, in animations, okay? When you want to see something that will uh, be animated throughout the page, you usually set an interval or, I don't know, 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, something like that. And at every uh, time it happens, you will shift the object a little bit so that it will give the impression of a, uh, of a smooth movement. Hmm? If, you, if you stay until one-tenth of a second, which is the perception time of your eye, uh, every, um, every stepwise step movement is, be, will be perceived as a continuous one. Of course, uh, there will be libraries for helping us to do that, but uh, this is the basic uh, mechanism. So I want to do something at some time interval, which will not be a precise, you, you can do a clock with this, okay, because it, it can be delayed. You, you see, you are setting 50 milliseconds, maybe we'll, we'll run after 60, because something else were, had to be done before, okay? So it's not uh, a, a measure of time, it's a measure of a, a a delay, a minimum delay, after which you can execute some code. So you also should take that into account. But, um, but the idea of using a, a, an, an interval for, for example, an animation uh, reminds us that the animation must terminate at a given point. So I, must, I should have a way of stopping the interval, or stopping this timer, OK? And in fact, I can do that. Uh, with another function which is called clear interval. So the set interval function will uh, schedule this function, this callback to be executed every two seconds, and will return an ID. And this ID can be used later to, if, if we need it, to clear this function, to clear this timeout. Because otherwise it will run forever every two seconds. So we need to handle, we need some reference to say which timeout are we, are we, are we deleting. Hmm? Okay, this is just a, a basic mechanism. We are not going to use a lot of uh, intervals and timers uh, uh, by hand. Hmm? Um, 
error management. Okay, let's imagine I'm reading something. Here we have another example, reading from a file. Reading from a file is something that maybe in many languages you are doing synchronously, okay? You open a file and you read line by line. In JavaScript, you cannot do that synchronously. You must do that asynchronously. So when you want to open a file, uh, you are scheduling the open function, the open operation, and setting a callback that will be executed as soon as the file is open. Which will, uh, will be just a small delay, but let's not wait uh, uh, synchronously for that delay. And when I'm reading some line of the file, okay, I'm scheduling the read operation, and I'm setting a callback to be called with the line that I just read. All like that. Every input-output operation is always asynchronous. So in this case, we have, uh, okay, I want to read this file. Imagine we have the read file from the file system module uh, that takes a file name and reads it, okay? We'll parse a JSON file into a data structure. Okay, nothing fancy, but of course I'm, I'm scheduling the operation here, read from this file, and I'm setting the callback that will be executed when the file has been read. May take 50, 100 milliseconds, okay? And so we can proceed with our code while the input-output operation is happening. When the input-output operation finished, then JavaScript will actually call this callback with the data that has been read. And so we can use this data, print it, store it, or whatever. Uh, what happens in the case of errors? An input-output operation may fail. Uh, but the context in which uh, I'm calling the read file function doesn't know it, cannot know it. Okay, I cannot say, okay, a read file returns a null or a read file generates a, uh, an exception, throws an exception. It's not possible because when <laughs> When I'm scheduling a read file, I don't know, I don't even know whether the file exists or not. I'm just saying, okay, try to do that and inform me when you, when you are done. So there is no meaningful return value from here, from this function. We cannot use a try catch statement here because uh, nothing can fail because I'm not doing anything in this line. Operations are happening, happen, happening asynchronously in a separate part of the code. So the only thing I can do here is to hope for the best and uh, um, ask uh, the callback function to handle the, the errors itself. The error handling can only happen after the uh, operation has been tried. So it can only happen, happen in the asynchronous handler. One convention, but it's just a convention of the Node.js library, is that uh, uh, in the function that may fail, there is a first parameter, which is an error code or an error message. Which, if everything is okay, the first parameter will be none, null. Hmm? Okay, there are no errors. If the first parameter is not null, then we have an error, and we should handle it in this way. So we have some code usually is, if we have an error, then we do something. Otherwise, uh, otherwise we can process the data. In many cases, if we, if we have an error, an error, we cannot even rely on the fact that there could be any data. Maybe there's no data at all. Okay, so the function itself uh, first should ask, should ask itself, uh, did everything go well in the asynchronous <laughs> time? If yes, if not, it will do something different. And anything it can do, or anything it will do, can never you know, influence the code that is around before or after this read file call, because that code is long executed time ago. It's already done, it's already gone, okay? 
So if it must have some effect, some result, it must happen in the future or in some other asynchronous code that we schedule. So it's a bit uncomfortable because we must delay everything and remember to do that. And when we have that data, how can we pass this data to the main program? Uh, the idea is that you can never pass data back from the asynchronous world to the synchronous world. Once something starts asynchronous, you still continue to do that asynchronously. Mm -hmm. Let's try to see some practical examples, okay, with something that we will use for the rest of the course. Database access, okay? So uh, we, have, we need to store some data into a database, um, a relational database, okay? tables and columns and uh, select statements uh, and so on. Uh, and all these operations will, of course, be asynchronous. There's no other way around it. And uh, uh, in particular, for keeping stuff simple or very, very simple, we are using SQLite uh, as a database. I don't know if you already know um, SQLite. is a database in a library, okay? In, in in comparison to normal database systems, uh, in a normal database system, we have a server, okay, that hosts and manages the database, and we connect to that server and send the queries and get the results. If you are using MySQL, it works in this way, okay? Uh, SQLite is much simpler. Uh, all the database is a, a library that you include in your code. It's a C library, basically. And uh, all the database is just stored into one file. So this file is a sort of private database to your application. It will still understand SQL uh, statements, uh, so you can use SQL insert and select and so on, but uh, you don't need an, another server to run on some uh, internet port, on some host and so on. It just run inside uh, your program. So it's quite easy, it's a minimal uh, type of database that you can use, okay? Um, and so in, um, in a node, you can just use the module which is called SQL3, SQLite3, three, sorry, and you can use it, you can import that and use, sorry, the slide is still using the, the old require syntax instead of import, but we'll correct it. And we can, uh, uh, okay, just connect to a file, this is the name of a file which is in a, we will be in our project, and run queries and do stuff. Um, for example, this instruction, new database, you see that new is a database is a constructor function, uh, receive one parameter which is the name of the file and the second parameter which is an error function. Again, this db will never tell, this variable db will never know when you inspect this here, this variable here, doesn't know whether the database was open successfully or not. Because uh, after opening that, that may happen after some time, it will call uh, this function with a null parameter, that means everything is okay, or uh, with an error parameter, with something which is not null and then uh, can, be, can be used uh, to, to detect the error. But this is executed later. Hmm? Um, okay. Once we open a connection to a database, we can run queries on that. Huh? For example, we have a database.all method, okay, that takes a, a SQL statement in the form of a select something a list of parameters of the query itself, uh, if we have some parametric query, and a callback function for handling the result. The callback function will receive the error information and the rows of the results. Uh, the all method will run the full query and create an array, which one element of this array per record, okay, per uh, row of the result. Um, and 
each row will contain objects uh, whose properties are the columns of the database. Let's see an example just to, to understand how it happens. Uh, this all method runs the query and returns all the results of the query. There are other two variations. One is uh, the get method that only gives me the first row. Runs the query, give me the first row, ignore the others, which is useful, for example, if you have a count or some other result that you know uh, all, uh, always returns just one row. Hmm? So you don't need to. I have an array in which you must only must uh, uh, read the first row. And each uh, uh, is similar to all in the, in the sense that it will give you all the results. Uh, but all gives you all the, re all the rows uh, in just one array. And each will only give you one row at a time. So if you have a result with 100 rows, this callback will be called 100 times, each with a different row, like a filter, like uh, for each. Okay? It depends on what you need to do. You prefer to have all the results and then work on those, or you prefer to process them one by one in your callback. So these are the, the three main functions that we have here. Uh, let's try to, to, to run it. Hmm? So uh, we have, uh, for example, uh, database dot. OK, so first of all, we need uh, uh, to have a database. We need to create a database uh, to, to run queries on it. OK, we are in, in, the, in the, the project, I already uh, uploaded this uh, question.sqlite uh, file. It's just a file that contains a database for our exercise of the question and answers and so on. So we can use that. Uh, for creating a database, you just uh, open a database and run some insert statements uh, in your code, or you use some uh, interface, some graphical interface for creating the tables, uh, and so on. Uh, how do I do that? Uh, uh, well, you, try to, you may use some, some tools. Uh, for example, for just uh, inside the Visual Studio Code, if I want to see the content of the database, uh, I installed an extension which is called uh, SQLite. Okay, it's an extension here, and there are several, but this is one of the simplest uh, that gives me an, uh, this open database operation when I right click on the database and opens a panel which is called SQLite Explorer that let me explore the structure of the database uh, which we have in this file. And if I click on the arrow, it will show me uh, the the data of the table itself. OK, it's very, very simple. You can just export. Uh, you can show or hide the content. Uh, but uh, uh, you, it, it, it's not an editor. You, just, you can just browse it, OK? You can create a new query if you want and write a query and execute it in that, uh, in that context. And, uh, but you know, it's very basic, hmm, I would say. Uh, if you want to do something more, you can download one of the many programs that are around for you know, managing graphically SQLite databases. You, I, I normally use this dbeaver. I don't know if you know it. Uh, it's a bit heavy, you know, but uh, it, it's, it's able to manage any kind of database. It's uh, based on the Eclipse platform. And uh, take some time as everything based on Eclipse, where, for example, I can uh, connect to some SQL, uh, MySQL databases uh, that they have in, on this computer for another course, uh, or I already installed here this uh, SQLite. We have the table. I can see the property of the table the data stored in the table, and also and so on. And here I can easily 
edit and modify it. Uh, so I, I can add some new, new items. Uh, there's a plus here for adding new row, adding new data, deleting, creating a new table inside the database. Uh, and so I can provide the column names and column types uh, easily in an interactive way. Okay, so this is one, the Beaver is one, one possibility. I think the, on the website we, are, we linked another tool which is specific for, uh, for SQLite. So uh, I suggest that you use some, in, you know, some graphical tool for creating the database structure and also putting some initial uh, data inside. Okay, not to write uh, the insert or create table statements by hand. Um, so I j just me, let me check the, the tool that we suggested. Uh, I think it's here. Yeah, this DB browser for SQLite is another tool, which is a, I, I don't like very much the interface because it's not very intuitive, uh, but it's much lighter, no, much faster than the DBver. And it only works for SQLite databases. So just pick your tool. There are many, many ones available, hmm? specifically for, for SQLite or in general for different types of uh, databases. Okay, so uh, in this context, we, we already have a database. So what we said is uh, question.sqlite. And let's try to, I, I don't know, uh, see the list of users. Hmm? We have a users table with some names here. So how does it look like? So we can, uh, first of all, import uh, uh, SQLite from SQLite 3, but we don't have a SQLite uh, module installed yet. So remember, whenever we need some external module, we must uh, um, initialize a project and uh, uh, download the, like we did in week two, remember you had the node modules uh, installed there. So before using a module, we must initialize the project in this directory. And uh, install SQLite 3. Okay, at that point we should be able to run, let's try if, uh, if the import runs okay, uh, and node db, okay, it, founds, uh, it finds the module, okay. Um, now we can create a, a connection to the database, const db from SQLite dot database, New, sorry, it's a constructor function. We create a connection to the database by specifying the name of the file. So questions.sqlite. And a callback function for checking the error. So error, uh, if error, throw error. For example, so that at least we, if there is an exception, we can, if it's in an error, we see that as an exception to be logged in the console. Okay, we are still not doing anything, but uh, we're trying to connect to the database. To check if it works, uh, let me just uh, put a wrong name. And, uh, oh, nothing happened, it doesn't create an error, even if the name doesn't exist. Well. What happened is that I created a new file with this name. So I would say, unfortunately, the database call, if it doesn't find the file, it will try to create it. And so the risk is that we go forward <laughs> with, a, with an empty file, and there is no error in this case, unfortunately. But if I have a path that doesn't exist, probably I would get an error. Yep. An exception that uh, 
uh, unable to open database file. In this case, it, can, it, it doesn't exist it, it, and it can't create it also because uh, it, I specified a folder that doesn't exist. But anyway, right now we, have, uh, we know that we are opening the right file. Let's get rid of that. Uh, delete, uh, remove, where are you? Delete. And we can try to, to run some query. So we have the DB uh, object that refers to the database, and we can use the db.all, uh, for example, statement. How does it work? We provide the query, select everything from user, okay? And differently from any language, other languages, where we have the query statement that returns a result set, returns an array, returns something, db.all doesn't return anything. It only schedules the execution of the query, and it requires a callback to be called when the query is completed. So uh, it's like... Um, Uh, a callback that requires uh, an error and rows. So error, rows. What do we do? This is the code that will be executed uh, after the query. And so, um, if error, I could say throw error. That's just a very, 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 very basic error management. Uh, if something happens, we throw an exception. Otherwise, we can continue by processing the rows. Uh, let's say the simple thing you can do is to print it and to see what what we received here. Okay, so let's run it. And what we get by this console.log is an array of elements corresponding to the rows of the query. Each element is an object. Each, element, each, each entry in the array is an object. The object has the ID, name, email, so the fields, the property names are the, we are the table user, are the column names. Sorry, I, I don't know if I can in, increase the text size here, but. Um, and the values of, the, of these objects are the um, strings or numbers uh, that are stored in the database. So if I only want to print the names, for example, I could uh, Let's say, let's not print everything. I only want to print the names, so I would have a rows dot for each. Print the name, console.log, so for each row R. Console.log, add name. For each. And I see only the name. I didn't do any processing I want with this list of names. I use the for each instead of for statement uh, just for fun. Instead, if I had uh, the same query with the db dot each call. Let's run the same query, the identical one, and see the difference. Uh, error, and just one single row. And then we do, we need to do all the same game. Uh, if error generates an exception. 
uh, you may ask yourself, but uh, why doesn't uh, the each method already generate an exception, throw an exception so that they can catch it? Uh, the answer is that uh, exception handling happened later in the development of JavaScript uh, when the SQLite and a lot of other libraries were already defined. And so there was already this convention of giving you an object uh, that contains the error message because there, at, the, at those times there wasn't still a try-catch statement uh, in JavaScript. Hmm? But right now that we have the try-catch, we try to handle uh, uh, errors or exceptions properly. Okay? Uh, in this case, we have uh, only one row, so we can uh, console.log. Maybe uh, row dot id row dot name to print something different. So in this case, you see that we are processing one row at a time in the callback. So the callback will be called many times. And we see the first execution and the second execution. If we swap the two, will it print in different order? Maybe, maybe not. Yes, in this case it does. But uh, you have a question, yes? Yeah, we know it's a good question. Uh, we are throwing an exception, but we don't know who is going to catch it right now. Okay, we will see it later on with the promises uh, object that will give us um, a mechanism for for also catching the, the exception. Right now, it's been thrown at the top level, and we should define an, an exception handler at the top level of our program because nothing in the local context is able to, to catch it. Uh, but we'll we'll avoid it, and we see. We need another piece of the language for, for handling that. OK. Um, I see here that uh, we are printing first uh, the, these four elements and then these other four. But it's just by chance. OK? If I run it many times, uh, well, in this case, it's always happening in this order. But there's no reason why the order should be fixed. We are scheduling two queries. We are scheduling them in the same time, or in two. At line six, I'm scheduling a query. At line 14, I'm scheduling another query. And they're being scheduled. They will be executed in parallel. Maybe one of them takes longer than the other. So the order of scheduling doesn't guarantee the order of execution of the callbacks, of course. That's a synchronicity. It happens when it happens. So it may happen that a query that I scheduled here will only be available later on. And so the, the second query that was scheduled here is faster. And the callback will be called before the other one. We cannot rely on that. And here we have one callback. Here we have five. Because this callback is called five times with five different rows. So there is no reason, sorry, four. Four times. We have five in total. One from the db.all and four from the db.each. So we have five callbacks in total. They could happen in any order. Well, the each guarantees to call them sequentially, first, second, third result, and so on. But there's no reason why we cannot, uh, we couldn't see in the output uh, the first two rows from here, and then the, 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 sorry, the code here from the second one, and then the last two rows. So we can see row one, row two, and the block of four, and then row three and row four. Okay? 
you cannot control that. We should basically program so that no matter what the execution time it will take, we know what to do. We never can say, okay, I already inserted some value so I can read it. No. I already scheduled uh, the query for inserting that value, but I don't know when the query will actually be executed. The only one that knows that the query has been completed is the code inside the callback. No other code outside, the, outside this can know this information. Okay? And so the main program, as I said, after scheduling some operation, the main program can do anything useful. How can it? Only the callback can do something useful because it has the information. Uh, there's also a game that we can do is to, now in the slides you see that somewhere in the slides uh, I have an example that uh, at the end you should, look, you should close the database connection. But be careful because if you close it here, hmm, you are risk, you're, you, you're depending on the asynchronous stuff, uh, the risk is that you are closing the connection before the, run, the, the queries are actually run. Because remember that of line 22 is executed after 14, but will be executed before this block. Hmm? So actually we should close the database after all the queries are, have been run, not before. Hmm? So, um, we tend not, not to do that right now. No? Maybe we have a shutdown function that will close a lot of resources uh, when we are no longer requiring these, these queries. So in this case, it worked, but it doesn't need to work. Huh? Um, so this is the, the minimum, uh, let's say, amount uh, of, of information for, for working the, with databases. Um, you see that uh, these queries also receive some params uh, in order to have some parameter behavior. So imagine I only want to return uh, uh, customer number or uh, user number three. Okay, so in my code uh, I have the information that uh, I want the user ID number three. So what I could do is to db.all or only one user, so uh, get. I know that the result will only consist of one row or of no, or zero rows if the user the, of the ID doesn't exist. So we can use get that only given the first row. And uh, I can read from user where ID equal to this user ID. Okay? Uh, a good way of doing that is not to concatenate the string. I could write something like this. Hmm? But it's a very bad practice because that if this was a string, I could be injecting some, no, you know, the SQL code injection. If, if the string is coming from the user, it can contain malicious statements or strange characters that will run a query which is different from the one they want. Okay? So never create queries by concatenating strings because you never know what is in this parameter that you can get from the user. And there is this mechanism by which uh, uh, you can specify some placeholder Say, okay, uh, this is a, a, a variable part. I put a question mark and they send the actual parameter in an array in the second position. So in this case, uh, where I would say, where ID equal to parameter and the parameter is uh, user ID. And then I have the callback error 
role. Uh, console.log user is uh, row. I didn't check for the error just for, for the sake of time. Uh, and uh, something is, okay, let, oh, sorry, const is ID. I forgot to declare the variable. Okay, and tell me, is telling me that user number three is this one. User is this one, okay? So whenever we have some query that depends on, on parameters, on variables, uh, always use the center. Question marks, uh, one or two or three or four question marks in the, in, the, in the string, in the query string, uh, and then the list of the parameters here as an array, as a second, as a second argument uh, to, the, to the database function. If I have many parameters, they will be taken in order. The first question mark will match the first argument, the second question mark will match the second, and so on. And in this way, the value of the number or the string that we are inserting into the, 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 the query will be protected, okay? In the sense that uh, uh, even if the string contains uh, SQL instructions or uh, invalid characters and so on, they will, the database will know that this is the string, these are the parameters. I'm not m misunderstanding a parameter f as a part of the string, uh, as a part of the query. So always use the syntax uh, and never do concatenation or string interpolations inside the SQL statement, which is a, a huge security issue. Okay, if I have uh, uh, some other query to run, which is not a select, there is another method for the database, which is called run, that would run any kind of statement. Insert, create table, update. Well, create table is probably not for us, uh, but insert and update uh, can be useful for managing our data. They don't return a, a result set. So there are no rows in the results to be returned. And so the callback function is much simpler. It only gives me the indication about an error or not. And what happens in the callback function is that we have some information about uh, the number of changes that have been made. So I, if I'm deleting a, a row, I should expect this variable changes to be one. So I can check it to see if actually the deletion words were correct. Or, and this is interesting, if I'm doing an insert statement and uh, the table has some auto-incrementing field, that which is normal in many cases to have a primary key to a number that increments automatically, then uh, inside this function that is called after the insert actually succeeded, we have the last ID value so that we can get this number. So I'm inserting something. I don't know yet its primary key. Only the database knows because it will auto-increment it. But in this last ID variable, I have this uh, information, okay? Um, and I can use it uh, maybe to, to create some relationships in the database or to store it somewhere else, just to remember it. So that also the caller now knows uh, what is the ID that has been assigned by the database to the name? Hmm? We'll see that when we do in the the the, um, the API calls, so the implementation of the API calls, which is um, a useful mechanism. The only um, warning is that uh, these variables, uh, the number of rows that are mischanged, so in the case of insert one, and the ID of this row are properties of the, this object, okay? And uh, this, the, this variable is only available for functions defined with the function keyword and not with the arrow syntax, okay? That's why here, no, in the first uh, slides, I always use the arrow syntax, but in this case, I'm using a function. You know, is the same thing except for the, this parameter. 
Uh, in the case uh, of, a, of a function, the, this parameter is local to the function itself. So it contains information about this function call. A narrow, fun a narrow function is lighter, and it doesn't define this object for the, this function call. So if I write this inside these braces, it doesn't refer to this function call. It will refer to the external context, because it doesn't, it doesn't redefine this inside. So it's a very, it's, it would be a complex stuff, uh, all the, the handling of, of this inside the JavaScript, the, this keyword is a very strange behavior. Uh, what we need to know if uh, basically the rule of thumb is if I would need to use this inside a function, declare it as a function. Okay? If you declare it as a narrow function, it will not find the value. It's just a, a warning that is here. Um, okay, this is what we did here. And uh, let's have a look at this code here. Um, it's similar to what we wrote. Uh, so we open a database, uh, specify a query with a join statement. Uh, let's forget about the tables. We have a db.all that uh, from each uh, row saves these results uh, into a variable result. And the result is a list that we define outside. So what is happening here is that we have a variable that is expected to collect the value that we read from the database. And the function is beautifully copying each row into this result. Uh, what is wrong here is that we are trying to use the result uh, at this point. When I, I, when I'm using this code here, result will be empty for sure like I said before never when you schedule some asynchronous call like the db.all the line after the, the call should never rely on any value any result that is computed by the asynchronous function because it's not available yet like we saw before with the timeout JavaScript will uh, execute this instruction, okay? This one, just a string, this db.all, that returns immediately without doing anything yet, and then prints this, and prints this for, and executes this for. But the result variable that we get at this line will be exactly this one. It hasn't been changed yet. It cannot be changed yet, because even in the, in, the, in the fastest query that we can run, this callback will never be executed until after we finish this sequential block of code. First we finish the code, and then we see if there are some callbacks ready to be executed. So since uh, this variable here and this variable here are in the same function, the same block of code, they will always be run together. Okay. After this is complete, after we print nothing, then we will fill the database, the data structure. Result will be filled for sure, but after we print the nothing that contained before. So that's why it's difficult not to extract value, uh, some values from an asynchronous function and use it in the main program. We should really shift our way of thinking. We should stop thinking sequentially. Uh, let's read something and then use the result. No. Let's say to somebody that is going to read something and it will use the result. Hmm? We need a, a mechanism to wait for something to complete before using the result. And this mechanism in JavaScript is uh, callbacks. And so there's a lot of uh, interesting behaviors. For example, imagine that we have a, a simple table with uh, one, one 
column, which is called number. Okay? And they want to insert uh, in this table numbers, one, two, three, four, five, or basically a set of ones in this case. It's even simpler. One, 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 one. Every time I run this insert, it will add a new line. And while I go, I will count how many numbers we have. Okay, so if this code is executed sequentially, as we have in mind, like these arrows, I will start from an empty table, insert one row, count one row, and print one. And then insert a second row, count the rows, there will be two. Insert a third row, count the rows, it will be three, and so on. Okay, it will be a way of uh, increasing the length of the table and printing at each step the number of rows that we got, okay? I really executed this code. So this is the real code that I ran some time ago in this example. And this is the list of numbers that I got in the right. So what I see here, I have a hundred, a loop that repeats a hundred times. Every time it runs this insert, db.run insert one, and the select the count of rows, exactly the query before, okay? Uh, if an error, answer, and, and otherwise, if there is no error, I will row the total amount of the first and only row of the result, okay? And let's look at the numbers. They are not sequential. They are increasing, thank God, but they are not sequential. 89, 90, 91, 92, oh fine, 96. And what happened to 93, 4, and 5? What well, happened that this went faster than that. So I skipped them. And uh, 1, 2, 3, 96, 96, 96, 7, 8, 9, 9, 4, 4, 400, 400, and so on. Which is Reasonable from the point of view of JavaScript. Because what we are doing, what are we doing here in this for loop? We are scheduling 200 queries. We have, this for will execute very quickly because it will just schedule 200 queries, 100 inserts and 100 um, select count. And they will be queried in order. One insert, one count, one insert, one count, one insert, one count. They will be queried, will be inserted in order. Okay, then, after we reach the end of this code, uh, JavaScript will start picking up uh, the scheduled queries and run them. And uh, I run the first one, and I don't wait for the first one to finish, because it runs asynchronously. So I pick the second one and I run it. I pick the third one, I run it. And then after some time, the first one will finish. And then the second one that I started will finish. And so I will run the mm, asynchronous callbacks of those queries, associated with those queries. But there's no reason why the completion times should be in the same order as the scheduling times. There's no guarantee that many queries run in parallel will all take the same amount of time. And the fact that they don't. Okay? So, the mistake here is to assume that this query will be run after that query was completed. And it, it doesn't. Okay? Uh, the only solution could be that if I want to be sure that this, the second query is run after the first one, is to put this code here, inside the callback of the other one. Then I will be sure. But in this case, it's not possible because then we have uh, many inserts also that we need to run in, in uh, we need to run the second insert after the first uh, select has been completed. 
you want to insert a second only after I counted it. So it also says that uh, this code should be run inside this callback, which is not possible <laughs> to have both inside and outside. So the problem is that uh, we have, a, with a very simple program, we have an, oper an overlapping set of queries that takes a different amount of time, unpredictable amount of time, and so there is no predictable sequence of results that we, that, we see, that we can see, that we can print. If I run this experiment many times, uh, I will always get different results, which is normal, okay? Let's not try to fight this. Let's try to exploit it, okay? So uh, to ensure it, uh, we should, uh, as we said, we should uh, execute the count only after the insert, so in the callback of the insert, and execute the insert uh, um, after the, the count, so in the body of the count. But it's not possible to do both things at the same time, okay? It cannot be inside and outside a function at the same time. We need a stronger mechanism, okay? So what happened is uh, in, the, um, in this JavaScript code, uh, the of asynchronous callbacks, uh, is that people started to use uh, some words like uh, callback hell, okay? Because you have the callback inside the callback inside the callback to, in order to make a synchronous behavior, synchro as much as synchronous you can, let's say predictably, a predictable sequence of, of, of actions, you have to put the first action in a callback, and then the second action in the callback of the first, uh, the third action in the callback of the second. So you have a nesting, a callback that contains a scheduling, that contains a callback, that contains a scheduling, and so on. And you nest until six or seven or 12 levels, and you don't understand anymore what is going on. Callback hell. And that's when the JavaScript designers invented or uh, a new method of handling asynchronous behavior. So there's nothing wrong with the way the calls of, uh, SQLite, uh, of the SQLite library work. It's normal code. We will use it any, uh, uh, always, OK? But uh, there is a better way, a more explicit way of uh, uh, handling asynchronous callbacks thanks to a new type of object, which is in, inserted in the standard library, which is called the promise. Huh? Uh, it, it doesn't take away the difficulty of thinking in a synchronous way, but it will take away some complexity of handling with the nested calls and so on. It will transform, and we'll see that uh, how after the break, will transform some nesting of callbacks into some sequential list of, 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 of cascading back, uh, callback, back, let's say. Hmm? So, so before seeing the solution, which is uh, okay. another layer on top of what we learned this morning, we have a, so this, the no, a classical 15-minute break, if you all agree.